Servus and hello there, my name is Andrew, I'm from the Shieldery and in the over 10 years I've been active in the living history hobby, during which I camped like more than 50 times on different events. In those I came across those five awesome items which we're gonna craft today. I wish young Andrew would have known them, not only because they are very easy to craft so you won't need all those advanced tools behind me, they are also money savers and make a huge difference on location. The first item is the only one that isn't historically correct, but I'm still using it on like every event though because those ground torches are just so versatile. I'm gonna show you the different applications later when we finish. But in order to craft them you only need some candle leftovers and loo rolls. I think I'm gonna call them corona candles from now on. Follow me to the kitchen where I'm gonna show you how to craft them in detail. I'd advise you not to start below 10 kilograms of wax or 22 pounds because the cleanup's quite messy and the results will be gone faster than you think because well they are just so awesome. Let's start to sort them by color into the thing we're gonna heat it in a flower pot. Let's start with like the red candles then go to white and to green at the end. Then we got like a more even result. By the way the flower pot shouldn't have a hole of course. <laughs> I know that 10 kilograms or 22 pounds sound like a lot, but you actually can get more than you think from friends and family if you ask around. In addition, you actually can buy that online for like one or two euro per kilogram, that's a good price. And you also can use old wax statues that are like broken. Those are also very cheap per kilogram. Let's prepare the loo rolls now. If you would just put them into the wax like this, you would need quite a long time if you want to light them on fire later because this is quite a sharp edge and you would need a lot of time to get the wax melting with only matches and stuff like that. So we're gonna roll a bit off of like one sacrificed roll and then put it into the middle from the other ones. Then you've got like very thin sheets at the top, very easy to light. Yeah, like that. Now we can also already put it into the oven because if the loo roll would be at room temperature, it would take way too long to soak in the wax because it would just go well hard again before it reaches the core. Let's also prepare our cooling area as good as possible that no wax gets through because removing wax also takes a lot of time. We want like an overlap here, so in order when we get the loo roll out, we don't accidentally grip in between. Now when it comes to removing wax, you can't get it out of clothing. Better wear the cheapest oldest thing you have. Over four hours have passed now and the wax has melted. Let's put our first loo roll in it. When it stops floating and goes down, we know it's ready to take it out again. Yeah, you see how it's still bubbling? When it stops, it's ready. Now while the next pot's heating up, we can already start with our next project, for which we ironically also need wax, but these wax, the good authentic one, because we're gonna make an authentic drinking bottle. Okay, I feel like I should add a small safety instruction at that point, because wax is basically just oil with a high melting point. What I have in common now is that the steam is highly flammable. That's why candles work. So don't get impatient and stay at 100 degrees Celsius. If, however, for some reason steam should appear Immediately turn off the oven, open all the windows. If it should catch fire, never put water into it because then you'd basically have an explosion, like with burning oil. So instead add a metal lid. You can use an ordinary frying pan for that. It also has like a long handle so you can stay a bit away from the flames. Stay safe. <laughs> I bought this beautiful Balgord in eBay for I think 20 euro. It has 20 centimeters times 30 centimeters. And I think it should have a volume of over one liter. The first step is to cut the top off in order well, for us to drink out of, for that, we should keep in mind how large our cork is. Amazon, five bucks, ten pieces, something like that. Better start with two less than cutting too much. <laughs> you can see I'm already pretty close, but we still got all these seeds inside. We're gonna get them out. The trick here is to put something quite heavy into it. I think I'm gonna choose round rivets and then shake it because that will like stump everything down. It will be a lot of shaking though. <laughs> That's how it works. Physics, baby! Okay, it took me like half an hour. But there's still something coming out. Okay. My clock says I spent one hour doing that. It kind of feels more like 15 minutes, but still. 
and here we go. That means we only have to make like the uh, opening a bit more beautiful and uh, well more better to feel like for the mouth and then we'll only have to apply the wax. Oh, very nice. Maybe a bit too loose, but I think that's a problem, which the wax will solve. Back to the kitchen. The beeswax has melted and I already put the bottle for like one minute into the oven too, because we want it also to be hot in order for it to soak in the beeswax as good as possible. But you should keep an eye on it and not go above 80 degrees, because otherwise cracks could form. Keep an eye on that, because we don't want cracks in the bottle, because water. Let me just get something to hold the beeswax thing with. I'm gonna put that aside. Ah, warm. Let's put a bit of the oil on the outside of the pumpkin too, because otherwise when it would get wet from the outside, like when it rains or something like that, it also would soak in the water again. We basically gotta make it water resistant on the inside and the outside. I'm gonna let it sit in the oven for like another one or two minutes until you can see that the wax on the outside gets liquid again. And then we've got, well, quite an even look because otherwise you can see the brush strokes and we can also not be sure now that everything is like completely drenched and soaking in but after those one or two minutes we are similar to the loo roll in the normal wax and that's how the circle closes my friends <laughs> i'm gonna let it cool down now and then we're gonna apply a second layer of beeswax because the first one just soaked in and the second one will like form an extra stash but only on the inside not on the outside for the outside it's okay i already heard a lot of people say that they just hate the taste of those beeswax treated flasks or bottles or stuff like that and to be honest that's nothing to be ashamed of when i started i had the same problem i'm gonna tell you something i wish i would have known then because you actually can reduce the taste by a lot if you just put some water into the bottle let it sit for a day replace the water and let it sit again if you do that like two or three times then the beeswax taste will basically be gone let's start with the third item while I'm gonna continue making those torches, I dropped one. While taking them out, it fell straight back into the pot and now I got like wax everywhere. My method of lifting them up is not the safest one, I should admit at that point. <laughs> if you got an idea how I could lift those better, please let me know. What I already tried but didn't work were those um, grilling equipment thingies. You also definitely before you cook something like to eat in that oven again turn it up to the highest thing you have in my case 250 degrees and let it burn through all the small little wax remainings you got in there otherwise the next cake will smell and taste very strange. <laughs> the next item is a proper walking stick which will last for thousands of kilometers and on events when they turn into a mud fight will help to avoid that you fall down all the time. Yes that happened a lot to young Andrew. My wood of choice here is hazelnut because it grows straight, fast and basically everywhere here. <laughs> Let's pick a proper branch. It should be a bit wider than you'd prefer because we gotta remove the bark later and it'll also shrink a bit when it dries. Maybe this one or the one behind here which you can't see at the moment. Wait, <laughs> yeah that one looks good. As you can see, it would be quite difficult to pull the stick out of those branches. The best chance we got now is to cut it at the length that we wish the branch, the stick, to have at the end. And then pull the rest through um, towards ourselves. My length of choice is when I can rest my chin on top of it. We want to make it look as awesome as possible. We got to remove the bark. And this is actually super easy and barely an inconvenience. When it's still wet, it's like peeling carrots. While removing the bark, you get a better sense for the stick's geometry, like how not straight it is on certain parts. I still left like, what do we have here? Like three centimeters that are too long for my taste. But this is good because now we can actually test like which side feels better in our hands. And I can already see if this would be like the bottom and I tap it, 
it vibrates much more. And this is bad because while walking you would lose energy because of that. But on the other side, it nearly doesn't vibrate at all. So this will be the top. Now we got a bit of a choice left where we want to position our hand because either we cut those three centimeters off at the top and then it stays that way or at the bottom and our hand would be a bit higher. Yeah, I like this more. Then I'm going to cut it off at the top. Another thing that maybe grabbed your attention is that little brown spots are coming into place here. This is parts of the inner bark we didn't remove properly, but this is all natural. We can just scrap it off with the back of the box cutter's knife. Ah, oh, it already feels very good. Now we only gotta give the tip a nice look too. I just put my thumb at the back of the knife here, place my other thumb on top and here we go. And we'll continue with the small cuts until we are in the middle. Uh, much better now, isn't it? If you want to make any other carvings on this piece now, I'd advise you to do it now because wet wood is just so much easier to work with than when it's dry. And the next step is to let it dry for like one or two weeks. If it's summer, put it into the sun. If it's winter, put it on the heater because on the next step, we gotta attach the very, very awesome tip that will last like for thousands of kilometers. But if the wood still shrinks after that, it will become a bit loose. I think this wouldn't be like the end of the world, but if we can avoid it, why not? I don't wanna let you wait for that time though. And that's why I'm gonna show you how to attach it on an already dried scrap piece of another stick. Only four days have passed now, but it already feels way lighter and well, dry basically. I think it would shrink only a bit if we waited longer, but I'm gonna risk it. <laughs> so the tips kind of consist out of this metal pipe, which has a diameter of 3.4 centimeters. First, we're gonna cut off three centimeters here. For that, I'm gonna use a simple hand metal saw. Of course, a edge grinder also does the job, but well, simple tools. <laughs> Now we only gotta deeper the edges. As you can see, the inner and outer diameter vary a lot. And if you wanna apply the steel pipe to the wooden stick, we're gonna have to remove some material. You should also pay attention to this small ridge you got here, because if you now try to apply it and always rotate it, it will never quite fit. So keep that in mind. <laughs> Now let's get back to our favorite tool. <laughs> now you can see that we still got a little ridge here. So we just gonna very carefully cut towards it. This is like the safest way because now let's just pretend I'd slip. Then my hand gets stopped by my upper body before the blade can reach anywhere. Now you can see that we already can put it over, but only a few millimeters. And you can see here, that's where it stopped. So now you remove it and shape those pieces off. Let's apply it again. I think I'm gonna mark the point where the nose goes in now. Let's just make a small V for that. Ha! Nice! But now you maybe ask yourself, if you're walking with that, wouldn't it slip down? And you're correct. That's why we gotta hold it in place with a nail, which we use as a rivet. In order to keep a rivet in place, we will now have to hammer it from different directions on a very hard surface. Not only I'm using metal blocks for that, but I don't want to overcomplicate it for you, so I'm just gonna use another hammer. <laughs> also, the best hammer type for this is one with like this spherical head, but it's also not that common. So I'm gonna use this normal one, and we're just gonna strike from different angles with not much energy. We don't wanna bend the nail, we want to deform the metal a bit at the edge. Yeah, now I can see that the holes basically disappeared and we only see the nails metal. But on the other side, it looks a bit ugly, I think. Let's give that a bit of a beating too. Way better. Nice. Now we're nearly finished. We only need to give this bad boy a nice finished coat of linseed oil varnish. I'm gonna let it dry before that, definitely. So I'm just gonna show you one who's already made. But while walking with this beautiful stick, you maybe have another problem, which is to transport the things you would like to have with you. Which brings us to item number four, a shoulder bag, which is very easy to sew. You can basically use any fabric you like. I'm gonna go with a one out of linen with a weight of over 300 gram per square meter. This will make it a bit more rigid for deformation. For the shoulder strap, we'll need a piece of 1 meter and 50 centimeter times 16 centimeters. You maybe think, yeah, 1 meter and 50 centimeters, that's a lot. But with the stitch I'm gonna show you, this will be a matter of minutes. And for the bag's main body, we'll need 35 times 70 centimeters. The top here will be the end of the bag, so let's round it up a bit. Yeah, well, 
something like that maybe. Fold it in the middle. The stitch we're gonna use is called the running stitch. Now let's just connect the ends here. It doesn't need to be very beautiful or very fine. Some stitches back and forth to secure the thread. This is like the perfect project to start with sewing because it doesn't need to be that precise. It won't be that important whether the stitches are all perfectly in line. It's ideal for beginners. I wish I wasn't uh, that much afraid of sewing when I started. Actually, it's quite relaxing and goes fast. Now we make a nut. This will be the future inside of the shoulder strap, so don't worry. And you can see I already only pull the thread through completely when I got like three or four stitches done. That also saves a lot of time. Here comes the awesome running stitch. You just go through with the needle through the fabric and then up again without pulling the thread through. By doing that, you will be very, very fast. After getting some stitches done, I can just put the fabric back to the needle's eye. Now continue for a bit. It's quite full and I can't grip the needle anymore. Then I gotta pull through. Yeah, I should maybe take care that the edges line up though. <laughs> What I still would advise you to do in order to secure it is to make only two or three stitches back and forth again before starting with the next needle. Because then if, you know, it would rip here or something like that, it would stop at this point where you made the back stitches. Before we can connect our two pieces, we gotta take care of those edges here. Also here on top, on the future top. We'll be doing that by first flipping the edge twice. We'll just make a quick break here. This will be the outside then. Now we can make a knot in order to secure a thread. And now the technique will be the following. We'll always sting under the double folded edge and then back from the front side without looking, without looking. Here we go again. We should try to keep it on one line though. And if possible for a 45 degree angle here. It's way more easy when you're sitting down and the fabric's resting on your lap instead of standing like I'm doing here right now. I can go for like three or four stitches before I have to pull the thread through. It's a bit depending on the fabric you're using. Maybe test it slowly with one or two and then increase until you feel like whoops that's too much. This is a good opportunity to show you how awesome the ground torches are now. And we are outside again. I want to show you how easy it is to set those up. The first one will be just on well an old piece of scrap wood I had lying around and the other one on a pile of dirt. <laughs> now in order to see how good they work I put a piece of white paper below them because now we can see after the torches are burnt down whether we got maybe some burnt parts or wax or something like that. So let's set them on fire and start the timer. And go. We are at 2 hours and 40 minutes. Incredible. Okay. Not burned. A bit wet from the underground, but well. And here, of course, too. Nice. And I bet I could reuse the board a couple of times. Now those torches don't only burn long, they also burn quite hot. So you could use them to heat your tent in the winter time. Not the ones made from modern fabrics. I'm afraid they maybe could catch fire, but the ones from medieval events, no problem with them. I already did that several times. They're also quite good to light the fire when the wood's gotten wet. That's like the three main uses why I love them so much. Now it's time to flip the shoulder strap and that's also a good use for the stick actually. Da, 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 da. Basically we will use the shoulder strap as part of the side of the bag. Now let's bring the parts where we flip the edge on the same height. And now we'll attach the shoulder strap like that. We are sewing on the inside because after we finished we're gonna flip that. That's why we're gonna sew on the part where we flip the edges too. Those connections will have to bear a lot of weight so I'm afraid we're gonna have to make smaller stitches here. <laughs> Insert the needle like that. I went back and forth and now we are at the height again where we started to sew, where we still have the open edge. Now we're gonna take the back of the needle and only go through the first layer like that. And now we can make a knot here which will secure the thread. <laughs> yeah. You can cut this off now. Let's continue over the whole length. When you're at the bottom edge, just flip the fabric like to a 90 degree angle. Because this is a possible breaking point, you should go a few stitches back and forth again. Then you can continue normally and gotta repeat that on the other corner though. Now when the edge of alignment starts, 
just pretend it didn't happen and continue normally. Don't think about that. Now after finishing the seam I went down a few stitches again and now we're gonna close the seam by stitching one time back and now we got this loop. Let's go through that twice without pulling the thread through completely. And that's it. We don't want to cut it like too short now. So let's just make two large stitches inside of the seam. And now we're gonna cut that. This is how it's supposed to look now. And we can flip it. Oh, I think it looks awesome. Now we just gotta find a way in order to keep it shut. And for that, we're gonna use a small piece of leather and some kind of string. You know, you could possibly use a shoelace or even better one, well, also out of leather. <laughs> In order to do that, we'll need two pieces of leather of two times four centimeters approximately, but it doesn't need to be that exact. Maybe make it a bit more smoothly. Now we're gonna need two kinds of holes in these. The first one will be quite small because we wanna sew those pieces of leather to our bag. The other ones need to be very big, but only two because we wanna thread our leather band through those. You could use an awl for the small ones, but punch pliers for the big one but you could get a result that's good enough just by cutting small diamond shaped holes with a box cutter's knife. Now why not? Let's make the small holes also with the punch pliers. As a side you could use an awl or also just a hammer and a nail. Estimating the center is enough here. Let's say they're quite high up. And now I'm actually doubling the thread. Because we want to hide our end again, I'm gonna pull it through here now. Now we can make our knot in between and cover it up. It's always a bit tricky to find the hole from the other side, but well. Now, let's go through a second time now. Let's only go through the leather here. I can make the knot. Just pull the thread through now. And there we go. We gotta make a small change for the upper one because I later wanna go with the leather band through the bottom like that. That means we gotta make a small hole in the middle where the holes are going to be. In order to do that I well first pick the position and then I'm gonna push it with a nail. See we got our hole but it could close over time. We gotta somehow make sure that it stays in place. The trick here is to just go around it like it would be a star. I know there are way better ways in which we could do that now but this is just enough for the use we're gonna have here. But for the second round we can give it another push with the nail. And in the and a normal knot is enough. Let's see where we place our second hole. Yeah. The last step for the bag is to just sew the second leather piece in place. Now look at that. It can easily transport five bottles of beer. And yes, that's how we measure volume in Bavaria. And I think it's beautiful. As beautiful as the shoulder bag is, you maybe need another thing if you want to like transport your sewing kits. If you would just put it in there, it would shake and everything would get messed up. That's why you'll need object number five, a wooden box. So let's head to the hardware store and buy the wood we need. You should take care that the board you pick is as straight as possible in every direction. Having only a small bulge is very important, so let's take that one. Keep your hands off of those glued laminated boards though. They maybe are a bit easier to work with, but are very sensitive to water. Now I know I got this awesome chop saw behind me, but little Andrew didn't have that. And you know, there's no shame in going to the professionals when it comes to stuff like that. Young Andrew thought he can just cut this with a jigsaw, but for some reason it never was straight. An excellent training opportunity though is the bottom board of the box cause it will be hidden when set in place. So we will remove two times the board's thickness from the side and the ending. The plate I'm using here is actually for cutting metal, but when you use it on wood, you will have way less splinters. You should also remember when you draw the line, whether you wanted to cut on the right or on the left side or straight in the middle. We will connect those pieces with normal PVA glue, but we have to keep them in place while the glue dries. Now it turns out screw clamps are actually quite expensive. It's like 10 or 15 euro one piece and we would need like six or eight of them. So let's only use screws, which we will remove later and fill in the holes with nice nails. First we gotta pre-drill the holes though. By the way, I know that it would be way better if like the wood texture would go in this direction, but it's not always possible for the people on the location to sew it in that way. So let's try it like this. The board's got a thickness of 18 millimeters, so we're gonna place them in the half, like nine millimeters inwards. The screws we'll use should be as thin as possible, but should have like a blank spot here, because then it can really press the boards together. This is our sacrifice board now, and we're gonna try to drill in a 90 degrees angle. 
In order to get the correct position for the holes for the boards we're gonna place around here, we're gonna first insert the screws until they slightly point out. Now first you gotta take care that they are on the same height and in the position you would like them to be. Now you can press them together. We've got our hole marking points. You also should give them numbers at that point because otherwise you'll confuse them. Let's say this is one and this is also one. This is also important for the orientation because after like the next four boards you won't be sure anymore whether you placed it this way or that way. You know what, let's drill that in for like halfway now because then this board of the side will be held in place just like that. Now it doesn't fall off. <laughs> Now in order to align the bottom board correctly, you should keep the side ones in place. Crap, I noticed my mistake. The board I'm working on is quite uneven. That's why it's not working that good. Take care that you got an even board. Do it like on a kitchen table. The problem is now, if you would drill in everything now, then the boards would crack. Now we know where to continue to drill the holes and one centimeter of depth is enough. After doing that, we can apply our PVA glue and you'll need less than you probably think. Now we can finally drill it together. You can see I don't need to press anything because that's how those kinds of screws work. Yeah, there we go. And while the glue dries now we can take care of the hinges and the lock. For the hinges we'll actually need another small piece of leather like from an old belt. We're gonna use those small nails but still I'd advise you to pre-drill because wood like that when it's so small it could chip easily. Gently tip it in for us to get a mark like that. Now we don't accidentally want to drill in the board beneath. Now you can see the nails poke out just a bit and this is something good because otherwise we will pull them out over time. Bend them over a bit. Now they'll see it. Yeah. Before we make the connection to the bottom, I want to take care of the handle. Let's just use another piece of leather. It would look awesome if they are in the same height. Let's just mark that. By the way, those are two centimeters broad and this one has two and a half centimeters. You know what? Let's pick a pattern here. Now let's see that the direction's correct. Oh fuck, you know what, we can solve this, don't panic. But first, let's make the front here. Three nails would be nice here too. I hope we won't have another crack. Now we'll definitely need a screw clamp to fix that, I'm afraid. But only one, so that doesn't count. Now let's open it up as far as we can without causing any further damage. And then put in a bit of the glue. I'm gonna use one of those little nails to push the glue in even further. We still got a line of glue here. In order to remove that, a wet sponge is enough. While that dries, we can make the leather button for the closure. Now we'll cut out kind of a T piece. The front end should have like one centimeter. That's way too long. <laughs> and the end here, three times four centimeters or something like that. Let's just wetten that for a second. Now we'll roll it up as tight as possible. The square shape ends here now. So gonna take again our box cutter knife and cut in here. Now let's pull that through. Maybe open it up with the knife a bit more. You should be careful not to cut yourself by the way. <laughs> And here we got our leather button. The idea now is that you can put it through the hole. Maybe we're gonna have to make the hole a bit wider. Ah, it's working. And then it should stay like that. But we'll be able to adjust the length when we apply the top. I just let it sit overnight and now let's see how it... Oh, awesome. Yeah, the crack's completely gone, like it never existed. Let's continue where we left off and apply the hinges. Let's also make sure that we are quite straight here. And again, just a small tap to make sure that we get the mark. Now for the closure, we'll place the button in the position we'd like it to be. Put a nail here. Now when it's just slightly held in place, we can test whether it works as we wish. And yeah. There we go, excellent. I think I'm also going with two nails there. You know what, I don't like how that closes back here. I think I'm gonna use a small nail here in the back. Better late than ever. Those two nails make a big difference. Now it closes way better. Now it's time to remove the screws and replace them with beautiful nails. A problem you maybe have at that point is that you made the holes a bit too large. Then you just put a splinter into the hole. A toothpick also would work. Break it off. There you go. Let's deburr the edges now, which also can be done with a box cutter's knife. Now you can also use this to correct some of the overlays here. 
Take care not to accidentally cut yourself, okay? It actually happens more often than you think that you're just like that much into the process that you don't notice that you cut towards yourself. Yeah, oh, well, why not? Let's deep the leather also. Your box cutter's knife blade should be very sharp for that. Before taking a look at the final results, I want to remind you that this video is not about how to make the most beautiful and advanced and medieval things. It's about how to start easily in a way that you don't have to invest hundreds of euros for the correct tools. So let's take a look at the final results now. Ah, the stick feels so awesome. I'm kind of curious right now what your next project's gonna be. If you want to see me craft something for the first time and know how to make more advanced reenactment stuff, check out this upper playlist. If you want to see me craft medieval shields in all different kinds of ways, the bottom playlist is something for you. And um, well, maybe before you click on them, consider giving a share, like and subscribe. Oh yeah, I think my break just started. Um, I'm just gonna stand here for a bit now.